My name is Doug Vakoch. I'm the president of Medi International. Medi International is a new nonprofit that is dedicated to messaging extraterrestrial intelligence, or Medi. Now, for over 50 years, there have been scientists engaged in SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Medi is the flip side. Instead of only listening, which we also do, we want to get ready to transmit and eventually be sending intentional, powerful messages of our own in the hope of getting a response back. The other part of what we focus on is to look at the factors necessary for intelligence to evolve on other worlds. For many years, people have used what's called the Drake Equation to think about what is relevant to knowing if there's life in the universe. And there are seven factors that focus in the first part on mainly astronomical uh, and, and biological things. So uh, how many planets are there around stars? If there are planets, are they habitable? And if they're habitable, did life actually arise? There are a lot of universities doing great work in those areas, but it seems like those last three terms of the Drake equation have been relatively neglected. If you have life on another world, does it evolve to the point of becoming intelligent? If you have intelligence, does it go on to create the technology to communicate? And then the big unknown, if there is a civilization able to communicate across the distances between space, how long do they last? Because that is the big unknown in terms of how many civilizations are out there. Humans are already sending out this bubble of noise, leakage radiation from television since Radio was created in the 1930s. And so there is this continually expanding radio bubble leaking out from space, announcing our existence to a very advanced civilization. Now, we currently, human beings, are not at the level of being able to depict, pick up that kind of weak leakage radiation. So if we were out at the distance of another star, we wouldn't be able to pick up ourselves. But if you have a civilization that is hundreds or thousands of years longer lived and more advanced than we are, they could potentially pick up I Love Lucy. So our, our emissaries to the stars uh, are Nightly News, Gilligan's Island, Howard Stern. The whole motive of METI is to say that in addition to these leakage radiation that's going out, let's take the message that we want to send into our own hands because making first contact isn't something that should be left to chance. The most famous possible signal from aliens came in the 1970s, and it's called the WOW signal. Uh, it came from the Ohio State University's Big Ear, a radio telescope that was looking for signals from other stars, looking along the, the hydrogen line, this frequency that hydrogen naturally radiates at, but looking for a very special kind of signal, one that's a narrow signal that nature doesn't create. And periodically, signals would be found, but this one particular signal stood out so that the, the guy looking at the printout the following day was so shocked, he wrote, wow, in red lettering in the margins. And so that has stood out as sort of the prototypical message we want to get from ET. There's only one problem with the wow signal. It's never repeated. Now, that's what SETI was like in the 1970s. You would find a signal, you'd analyze the data, you'd go back to it, and then later you'd try to find it. But the great advance of SETI in the recent decades is we now have the ability to do an immediate follow-up. So now we get all sorts of wow signals, but as we go back and we don't find them again, we realize they're just a glitch and they become so what signals. So we find signals very similar to what we're looking for all the time, simply because we're looking for the sort of signals that are very similar to our, only radio, our own signals, radio and TV signals, only much more powerful. The challenge is when we find something good, we have to make sure it's not from a satellite in orbit and not from a radio transmitter here on Earth but that it's from a distant star. And to date, no good candidates. When we're looking for a signal from another civilization, the key is the nature of the signal itself. When you look at radio waves that are created by stars and galaxies, they emit radiation that is spread out over a range of frequencies. In SETI, we look at some of those same frequencies, but we look for a very narrow signal. 
a kind of signal that nature cannot create. So simply by the nature of the signal itself, that will be a sign that this may be from another intelligence. The second step is to see that within that signal, is there an encoding? And particularly when you start thinking about laser pulses that are sent at the length of a billionth of a second long, you can imagine something like an interstellar Morse code, short and long pulses. It would not only indicate this is from an artificial uh, transmission, this is a sign of another technology, but it's packed with information. The challenge then is to figure out what does it mean. One of the most fundamental assumptions that we have made in the last 50 years in SETI, searching for extraterrestrials, is that all we have to do is listen, and if they're out there, they'll make themselves known. And the reason we assume that is because on a cosmic scale, we are most likely the youngest civilizations out there with an ability to communicate. If other civilizations are as rudimentary as we are, they have the technology for interstellar communication for only a century, and then they either destroy themselves or turn inward, then civilizations will be so few and far between we will never make contact. You know, it's, it's almost as if you imagined two fireflies that each flicked on for just a second over the course of a whole night. That's what it would be like for another civilization that lasts 100 years and our 100-year period to overlap in the course of the 13 billion year history of our galaxy. So in order to succeed, the other civilization has to be much older. The usual assumption that goes with that is that the more older, more capable civilization will also take on the added burden of transmitting. And that's a question that we, that's an assumption that we question at Medi International. Because to me, it seems like the civilization that has the most to gain is the one that hasn't been through this process before. And so while I'm a firm advocate of continuing to search for signals, I'm a, a, an even stronger advocate for sending transmissions of our own in the hope that maybe that's what the interstellar protocol dictates that in order to make first contact, you need to show some initiative. I mean, if you go to a cocktail party and just hang around the wall all the time and don't even say hello, you're not going to have very interesting conversations. Maybe that's the way interstellar communication works as well. I think the best opening message we can say is to communicate something that an alien would understand. Now, they won't understand English or Swahili or Chinese, so I wouldn't start with a, a, a human language. But math is a language that it seems like an engineer would need to know. I mean, if, if you don't know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, you're not going to be very good at building a radio telescope. Now, they may have different forms of mathematics, so even that isn't obvious, but it's a natural starting point. And so, too, some basic principles of science. But I think even more exciting is when we start to use math and science as a language to say something that goes well beyond them. So if you look at music, for example, much of the structure of music can be described in mathematical terms, in physical terms. And so if we can talk about the structure of music in terms that an alien understands, that may actually be an opportunity to give them a window into our soul to express not only how do we understand the world about us, but what does it mean to us. As we've been searching for extraterrestrials, our search has gotten more and more powerful with every passing year. You know, when Frank Drake did his first search in 1960, he had to choose a single frequency and he had to choose just a couple of stars. And part of that is that it takes so much computing power to crunch through all of the data. But the good news is computers are getting cheaper every year. So now we've looked at over 10,000 stars very carefully, and not just at one frequency, but at billions of frequencies. So a lot of the guesswork is taken out of it. If we project that continued development of computing over the next decade or two, we should be able to look at a million stars. And so I would say if we're going to find ET, it's probably going to be within the next 20 years or so, because that gives us enough time to look at about a million stars. And if they're out there and trying to make contact, that's a reasonable number to begin with. 
METI or messaging extraterrestrial intelligence is a tremendously controversial topic. I mean, no less than the cosmologist Stephen Hawking has said, whatever you do, don't transmit a message to extraterrestrials. Well, there are a couple of things to say about Hawking's warning. First of all, he said it in 2009, and his concern was that the aliens were going to come here and strip mine our planet because it's so rare. Well, in 2009, we didn't know that Earth-like planets are really very prevalent. So the raw materials, you can find much closer to home. But I think even more important, it, it, it's true. An alien civilization may have the ability to travel between the stars and to do us harm. But if that's true, it's too late. Any civilization that can travel between the stars and annihilate Earth could already pick up our accidental leakage radiation once it makes it that far. So sending a powerful intentional signal is not going to alert those powerful civilizations to our existence. It could let a twin of Earth with our own rudimentary knowledge know about our existence, but they don't have the ability to travel between the stars. So we have no increased risk of exposing our existence to a civilization that can come do us harm. I think, in fact, we're better off to control the message that we want to say so that if they do arrive, they'll know that we have made an initiative to reach out so that we can establish a peaceful discourse.